to the command. There you go. You're all familiar with, with the um, protocol with regards to recording. We always re um, record our events <laughs> and um, afterwards they get posted on the Guyana Speaks Facebook page. This event, which is in <coughs> collaboration with Renaissance One, um, will be shared both with Guyana Speaks and uh, Renaissance One. Um, so if during the Q&A you don't want to be recorded, just let me know. I can edit out the... Um, I'm not gonna edit out the main section of this, but in the Q and A, if, if you don't want to be in it, let me know. Um, but yes, just going back to the book, I'm gonna start from the beginning about the book. So um, the title is Year of Plagues, a memoir of 2020. And it was published in August uh, this year. It's the first nonfiction book from the acclaimed British Guyanese poet, novelist and playwright, Fred Degas. And the plague refers to um, the plagues referred to in the title include the COVID-19 pandemic, the author's own battle with cancer and social unrest brought about by the public lynchings of George Floyd, um, Ahmed Arbery and the murder of Breonna Taylor in the States mm -hmm. and the subsequent growth of the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. And um, despite the pain and hardships of Degas' subject matter, Year of Plagues is described here as musical, poetic, often, it's often humorous, um, and it's a mixture really of autobiography and meditations on society and literature. So, um, firstly, before I introduce, sorry, I go on to speak to Fred, I just want to point out that there is a Renaissance One event um, that's being held on Tuesday, the 26th of August. Um, sorry, October. So the title of the event is Renaissance uh, Speaky Spoky Meets We Liming. And, um, <laughs> and uh, so Melanie Abrams, who is the founder, I believe, of, of, of Renaissance One, um, has asked us to join them for um, our word and music line this autumn. It's basically literature and spoken word and music and togetherness. And it's going to be from 7.30 to 9.30 uh, at the chapel of the house of St. Barnabas. And so for those who don't know, that's in um, Greek Street, just off Soho Square. It's going to, um, of course, include, well, Fred's going to be there, of course, but also um, Camilla George, who's a saxophonist, composer and band leader. There's also going to be Tobago Cruzo. I'm sure most of you will be familiar um, with the famous Kaisonian, Kaisonian uh, ex-tempo artist. And it's gonna be hosted by Gabrielle Gabadamosi. I'm probably massacring um, Gabrielle's surname there, so apologies. Um, the acclaimed poet and playwright um, and co-founder of Writer's <coughs> Mosaic. Um, and of course, um, it's also hosted by the producer and curator, Melanie Abrams, founder of mm -hmm. One. So um, let's move on swiftly. So Fred, I just, first of all, huge, huge welcome. And um, I'm relieved having read your book uh, that you made it through 2020. It's, it's an astonishing book, I have to say. I, I really, really loved it. Um, I read it at the speed of knots. I, I think Melanie managed to send me a copy a couple of days ago. And I was really worried I wasn't going to be able to like read it, but it's just so um, gripping, you know, it's something you can read really quickly, but it also, I felt it really, it's hugely personal, mm -hmm. but it also speaks to how many of us, I think, felt in a way about 2020. It was just such a hideous, such a hideous year. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I absolutely loved it. And I just really want to extend a huge thanks to Melanie Abrams because um, she of course is the one that has introduced us and um, we, we wouldn't be doing this without Melanie and Renaissance One. So, um, but um, I, I, I guess I wanted to start with the, um, with the title and the cover of the book. And um, did you actually choose the title? And, and can you say something about the cover photo as well? I mean, what does, what does it really signify? I mean, I can see it's a medieval mask of some mm -hmm. sort. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, oh, well, well, thank you so much, um, Juanita. Thank you, Melanie, as well, for, for organizing things. I hope, um, and all the people who've tuned in, thank you for tuning in. Um, I look forward to your questions and, and thoughts. Um, the, cover, the cover was chosen by Carcanet, um, 17th century plague mask. So um, it seemed uh, appropriate given that it's our first um, pandemic um, in, my, in my lifetime. Mm. So it made sense that uh, the response would be to see it as a, 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 in, this, in similar terms to the plague year, you know, going back. Yeah. Um, to that recurring. Um, no, exactly. I, I think when I first looked at it, I was like, why, why did they choose that? But then, of course, it's this kind of the return of the plagues, you know, I mean, it's like sure. the return of um, the Spanish mm -hmm. flu or, you know, we've, we've been through this um, so many times, but the whole thing of history being quite cyclical, I guess, in, in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I just wanted to say that you you kind of you offer the reader a really open and um, unashamed window into the body and mind of Fred Degas. It, it, you know that's how I really really felt about it. And um, you you know you someone who's facing their mortality and maybe on a more sort of material bodily level, you know, this huge intrusive medical scrutiny and all these the procedures that you have to go through. Um, and your thoughts, your thoughts come across as really, really uncensored um, in a way that I found fabulously refreshing. But uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if I don't like a lot of people aren't really used to being that open or hearing people speaking that openly. Um, and I just wondered, you know, what was censored? Because there's a lot that isn't. But what was actually censored? What were the issues that couldn't go into the book? Um, a lot of issues, <laughs> you know. Well, first of all, thank you for, for saying that it's um, full of um, frankness, which is always, you know, should people people not go rushing out to see exactly what those, you know, ju the juicy bits are. And it really is, if you're talking about cancer and its treatment, you know, you, you have to talk about the body. Um, so it wasn't a hard decision to to say, you know, just describe what's going on and talk about recovery and then make the connection to the, the wider pandemics and the wider cancers ailing the society. Mm. That the sick body, my sick body, um, happened to coincide with something going on outside my house that I had to pay attention to, that I couldn't ignore no matter what I was going through. But the uncensored bits, I mean, you know, when you write a sentence, you, you have to make sure it's, um, impolite in ways that your mom would accept <laughs> you know so i said can my mother read this yes she can <laughs> that was mostly well, my guy i guess your mother bathed, bathed you as a baby i mean there's not a lot she wouldn't know about you in well, a way any parent knows what you see and what you don't see and, and yeah. i think there's something about decorum <clears throat> that you know you can't be coy you yeah. better say you know this is modern let's let's speak frankly but yeah. you, know, you don't want to be vulgar so I, no, I, I, but I, I, I still, I, I, I don't know whether there's something about being in England or, or, or being English, because I still feel we don't talk about things very oh. openly. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as a menopausal middle-aged woman, <laughs> you know, I always feel like it's something that no one talks about. You know, yeah. there's a lot we don't talk about and we don't talk about frankly. Sure. So sure. I, I loved, I just loved the frankness. I, I found it so refreshing and I, I can see Clem's, is, is that Clem? Oh no, it's not. I thought there was um, Professor Clem Seashan was online, but it's it's um, but he's not. But David Aberdeen is, oh, and I just thought I'd David. share the kind of um, humor because <laughs> it's kind of this wry yeah. satirical humor. Um, and you you know you talk about things like the um, you know you you sort of contemplate knitting bonnets for your block and tackle, and I, I just found it so. Humorous. Uh, really uh, Juanita, let me quickly say, well, first of all, you know, hello, hello, David, um, fellow countryman and writer. Uh, hi, hi, Fred. Um, yes, sir. Here. Thank you for, for tuning in. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, there is, there was a clip, a clip. So when I wrote that line about the block and tackle and stuff, and I was quietly thinking of a clip, many clips as I was growing up in Guyana. One of them, uh, let me think if I remember, I can't sing it, but I'll try it. Um, oh, Lord, 
my bucket got a hole in the center. And if you think a telling lie, push your finger. And although it was slightly allegorical and metaphorical, everybody knew what the bucket was and what the invitation was. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> so even then, I was quite young and we used to laugh and thought this was the most wonderful um, conceit in a calypso and it got away, got past the censors and it was really rude and rock, rockish. And it was memorable. It was a mnemonic the way it was talking about. We used to fetch water in Airy Hall for a while before the standpipes and everything got you know, better into the houses. But so we knew what, what those buckets were literally, but metaphorically, well, that was some new information. We appreciated it. Um, <laughs> and so I thought, you know, I must keep that. I must remember that in the middle of um, whatever you're doing, there, there is a way to look at it that will convey it, carry it across, lighten it a little bit for the reader, but also enshrine it in a way that makes it memorable mm -hmm. as, a, as a piece of literature or utterance. So yes, I, I'm glad to, to be raucous in there in that Calypsonian spirit, mm -hmm. but I hope it doesn't offend. No, not at all. In fact, saying that, I mean, I think, I think a lot of us who are brought up in the kind of tradition of the calypso will be will be very comfortable with it all but um yeah um you talk about you, you know you reveal early on in your book your tendency you can hear my husband in the background i um he's speaking to uncle eric who's like um a community elder that we always like to have on guyana speak so um I'm, he's just trying to help him um, get connected um, but moving on, I just I just wanted to say that you normally because I, I think what I found kind of refreshing is I'm used to people being very open in fiction, mm -hmm. you know, and of course, in fiction, people say whatever they want. Um, and and you quite often feel that a lot of fiction is autobiographical in its in its own way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think that's what it is that I was I was surprised that that appeared in in, in the memoir, I guess. Um, and in a way you've answered it, but I, I wanted to just sort of pry further into that as to why it was so important for you to kind of document your experience in such a transparent and open way. Yeah, um, there, there is a, lo a long tradition of um, speaking the body when it's ailing in literature. Um, and I haven't written a long nonfiction piece in a, sustain a sustained way. I was waiting to do it. Um, because I was busy trying to get the fiction to work and you know, teaching and poetry and so forth. But so this was my chance, um, just as the pandemic struck and with George Floyd and Breonna, Breonna Taylor, and Armand Arbery and so on, mm -hmm. some of the things that were going on with the Trump regime at the, at the time, I felt that outside certain cancers had reared their heads, social ones. Mm -hmm. So it made sense to address it directly, you know, get rid of metaphor. Yeah, no, and, that and, was- And stare was... it down, stare it down because <laughs> it was threatening, you know, it was threatening and people were, were thinking what to do, you know, and, and so it, there was a feeling that um, a, a direct approach for a change, not indirect, mm. well, some indirectness, but a, a direct approach would actually yield some truths about you know, it is, you know, about sentences and sense mm -hmm. in an age of nonsense, not nonsense in a Jabberwocky, useful kind of way, yeah. but some bad behavior that was irresponsible in a public way. So I, I, I um, and I wanted to look at despotic authority. I'm interested in how, how to enliven the body of despotic authority to, so you can pay attention to people, not see them as this, you know, throwaway people. And you, you know you want the art, if it's worth its salt, um, bread and butter, whatever the metaphor is. If it's worth it, to 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 be able to to grapple with difficulty, not be ashamed, don't shy away from it. Um, mm. Speak plainly, well, speak metaphorically too, but speak, and be in conversation with things. I talk to people about all the time as a teacher and reader. I come across all the time, so. It made sense to you know to think to think about it and then, and then finally too in relation to that pandemic and my illness and the police brutality of those three cases and the public white supremacy as they call it in the U.S. Um, when Arbery was killed you know cornered by three people hunted shot you know it was a classical old case scenario of a lynching um, 
Tacitos have come back. I, I wanted to go to a place too, and this is where Guyana comes in, and my childhood. I wanted to not just talk about those, but to say, well, where do you find strength if you're facing something that's threatening? Uh, where do you go to draw on strength? And some of it is memory, some of it is imagination. But I found my time in Guyana as a kid, my guy, that, that was very helpful to me. It was Airy Hall, which is near Maikoni, East Coast of Marara, my time there and some years in Georgetown as a child, give me a childhood. It was a fabulous resource of memory stories um, that helped me to think about my adult calamity and the threats to my body mm. in, in, in useful ways. Yeah, I, I, I loved that. I mean, of course, I, I would. Um, I, you know, I like that you sort of referred to the homeopathic me uh, remedies. You know, you've, you've been mm -hmm. um, to Guyanese homeopathic remedies, but also mm -hmm. that you were talking about things like, um, uh, you know, the dropping of utensils, signaling uh, the arrival of strangers or, or throwing salt over your shoulder or um and kite flying in in airy hall i mean could you tell us a bit more about your like when did you because you were born in london right was that is that right in, in near yeah. blackheath or somewhere yeah um i think it, yeah my mom was i was born in wimbledon but she moved okay. to hither green south london near okay. blackheath then later on settled she settled in blackheath but um when i came back but when i was two we left london okay kids, and then came back in 72 to okay so London. so so you were you were brought up in guyana from the age of two until you were what a teenager or yeah 12 to 10 years yeah two to two to two to 12. 12 okay yeah so what were your you know like i i noticed um one of the one of the great things in the book is the chapter called help help me and nancy and of <laughs> course i actually I started, I read the first chapter and then I thought, no, I'm going to skip that. I want to, I want to know about Anansi. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we grew up with hearing the stories in school. Um, Novar, Novar Government School, and everything was renamed and given numbers and so forth. But, you know, you still remember Airy Hall and Novar, and you could recite the towns that you drive through. Um, we, we would, and Nancy was a trickster, of course, and he always got his got his come up, come up, and but occasionally he would win some. As he was, you're telling the story of Nancy. You're behind him. You want him to win, but then you want him to lose because he seems selfish. <laughs> and so the stories appear to be telling you how to live and share and be a good person in society mm. by using this this West African um, story of the trickster spider. I liked him too because of his um, transformation that he was you know human anthropomorphosed mm. but a spot an, an insect a trickster figure so both his bodily change and the tricks he played that appear to enshrine the culture and tell us about memory and how to, how to be a citizen in a community made it a really good vehicle to go to when i thought about well what are the survival mechanisms for a writer threatened in a culture threatened biologically with cancer, you know, where do you go? One of the places is the fairy tales and the mythical tales that enshrine a culture that you belong to and admire mm. with humor, with, with tricksterism in the middle of it. And, I, and also a shape, shape shifting nature in the Nancy. So all kinds of reasons to do with um, mm. the fairy tale and the culture and the childhood that, it, that I picked up um, and Nancy. And mm. one of the stories that I really, really like about Nancy, which I tell, <clears throat> is the one which there are so many varieties, but uh, this is a short story. I won't be long. But you know, he, he gets these come back, he comes back to his family with five, five bananas. He has a wife and three kids, or a wife and four kids. He hands out the bananas, all five. He has none in his plate. He looks forlorn. They look at him, they take pity on him. They all take off a piece of their banana and give it to him. He ends up with one and a half or something. <laughs> he has more than they have. They have three quarter. He doesn't say anything. He just, you know, knocks it back, which is typical of Nancy. If he had more, if he was more magnanimous, he would say, oh, stop, stop, stop. You know, I've got enough here. But no, he lets them all, you know, all break off a piece. And he, he's very shrewd too. When he gives them all a banana and doesn't have one, he knows what the outcome will be. He knows that you know when he looks the way he looks, they'll take pity on him and give him a you know a little piece of each from the, from all of their bananas. So that's a typical one of his stories, and 
in the online versions, of course, his wife shames him and says, hey, look at your plate, Nancy. It's, you know, kids have three quarters. You have, you know, one and a quarter or whatever it is. Um, how, could, how could you go ahead and start eating like that? And then, you know, he has to say, okay, you're right. I'll, I'll go back out again and try and get some more food. He doesn't. He wants to yam it down. So <clears throat> I liked him both finding the meal and providing, mm. but also mischievously. Mm. taking back as much as he can mm. and some of that given to and fro in the culture about how you share what is guilt um how do you how do you develop that in your in your body and your nervous system so you feel responsible about something and you mm. have a conscience because you can turn conscious uh, conscience off i was interested in how you keep it going in the culture <clears throat> and 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 excuse me um so yeah Mm. So, so I don't know if Jan Scheinborn's actually managed to make it today, but she emailed me a question ahead of time and she just, oh. she, she actually asked, what is the significance of your use of the Anansi story in, in telling your story about your struggle with stage four prostate cancer? So I guess she just wants to know, you know, how did Anansi come to play such a powerful role at such a critical time? I mean, you've partially kind of explained it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a line that you say, you know, you have to trust in an ANSI, you know, as both a character and a process. And I wonder if you could kind of expand on that. Yeah, the, the process is um, storytelling as a regenerative force, um, not just theory, but story. And, or both, you know, the, the theory is wrapped up in the story mm. and the fable. Um, so I wanted those things to, to let pe the reader know I was going to lean on those things at myself in telling my story. Mm. And that everything I, that had made me up to this point would be drawn on because I needed every single resource because I was in trouble and mm. I needed help. And that as a writer and reader, that was a place to go. It was surely a place to go. Mm. Um, because it was encouraging imagination, encouraging an, an idea of the future too. You know, writers, because of our how we write, it takes a long time to do a book, wait for its publication, watch it languish on the shelf, <laughs> ignored or not, or wait for readers to find it, reviews <laughs> if they happen, <clears throat> the luck of all of that. Um, as that process is such a long process, it's a, you realize the writing is about the notion of a future that is probably going to be there that you'd like to put, send something to mm -hmm. in the present. You're also aware <clears throat> of a past that's informing the action of thinking and writing. So that gives you a real historical imagination, inevitably, that you have to pay attention to and cultivate. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in, in all of that, which is why I pointed to Nancy as fable and myth mm -hmm. as one route route a route, route. <laughs> i know i know i say i say route <laughs> um, I, I know people say route uh, but uh as one of those ways in mm. knowing that there are many many doors and many ways into into um, looking at it mm. and one and being interested in the kaleidoscopic approach to not simply narrative mm. um but also some of the quantum wilson harris things that i got from reading yeah, him. I, I, love I, I loved all of that too. I, 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 I don't know. Um, I was talking to, um, I really wanted Stanley Greaves to, to come on and I, he, 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 he was so eager to be uh -huh. on this program that he logged in yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very Nancy thing to do. That's a, I know, <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> that is, well, <clears throat> Stanley's a great artist, as you know, his, his work. I've used one of his works <clears throat> for one of my book covers, actually. So mm -hmm. Stanley, Stanley is, is phenomenal. So, yeah. I, I find it really interesting because I, I, I feel like there's something about, it's either about Guy, Guyana as a, as a country, the kind of landscape of Guyana that mm -hmm. leans people towards that kind of interest in the metaphysical and, um, you know, because even, um, you know, obviously Stanley is like with his art and Wilson Harris, but also Edgar Middlehouse, other, other Guyanese writers have that same, seem to have that same sort of interest um almost like a form of magical realism for me uh, you know i i think of it as magical realism as well um did you did you come to that way of thinking through writing or through actually having been in guyana 
you know, it had to, I, I, it has to be that um, the, the, the 10 years yeah. in Guyana shaped, shaped that. Mm. Otherwise, it would be an, an intellectual exercise to understand magical realism and say, oh, yeah, I can see it as a literary device. Yeah. And it's not, a, for me, you know, the way, the way we talked in, in Harry Hall about the day and about light and actions, very ordinary actions, you know, take it down from the tree, throw a stone up at the right fruit to come down, wait for the, you know, the, the coconut to drop, um, collect up. You know, so the things that we did were ordinary things, but we, we, we talked about them in, in ways that um, embellished them with some of the sustenance that they provided. Mm. for us fed our imaginations and so forth i mean the david the david is logged on he, he will help with this but um and he, he's written a book called you know Cooley odyssey he you know mm. he has he's written many wonderful things but that particular poem remakes the journey mm. and it's it's pure homer it's pure homer remakes the journey of, of, of indentureship and belonging in the landscape and the kind of way in which you drink the water and you walk on the ground gets dust gets in between your toes and then your imagination of course mm. can't ignore what the body is facing it's a hard thing too it's a hard life airy hall i didn't know it at the time as a child nobody said to me hey fred boy you're having a hard time being hungry i didn't know about poverty um it was childhood um it was land-based we ate but it wasn't lavish the rice was planted and there was a harvest. There was no waste. The water had to be fetched. It was heavy, <laughs> but you know, we did it. We did, and so there was something about the childhood that was totally oblivious um, to some of the meanings to do with mm. being in a countryfied location. One of the things I celebrate about Guyana and the national motto is this land of six peoples. I know I don't want to get bogged down in the, the politics and the separations and the anxieties of some of how that politics is, but the ideal of it is, is an imaginative one and a real one. Of, you know, Douglas, if I say that word to you, the mixing up of things, the, the potpourri of it, the sense that you can't keep these things separate. You can try, you can have a rhetoric for separating them. You can make those linear arguments, but the truth is there is an incredible richness in the mixture and the reading across things and the speaking to each other and not allowing the fences to stop that. Mm. Um, and I delight in that. I delight in that mixture in my family roots. You can see me. You can look at me, you know there's a mixture. A little bit of Potagi, a little bit Potagi. of Africa, and some India, and, and I, I like I, I like that. I mean, I thought Wilson Harris was supreme at expressing that <laughs> in an oblique way, metaphorically rich, but insisting on ind indigenous information and way of being within the land. The land is instructive, a mixture of peoples, as an insistence for making a nation a celebration of that and if we have to shine it back at politics consistently and say look look at power let's share it a bit let's understand and have an account for that complexity in terms of our power sharing then we should keep that conversation going even if it's complicated and difficult um and and, sh and be more and more generous in our accounts for that that means that cuts me out for not for politics at all. I understand when I say that <laughs> and I speak to that richness. And maybe that's why I'm writing and staying out of the fray. Mm -hmm. But it, because it made me think about that richness and it came from that experience, I think it's only fair to talk back to that complexity and say, look, if, even if you're waiting for that to be born in the land, look how it shaped so many writers' imaginations. Mm -hmm. um, if it is a university of hunger, as Martin Carter would say, is the university of hunger the wide waste? Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at that and let's see the way in which the poem marches forward and constructs something positive and it's activating of a passive people, if they are passive, into an active and participatory people through an active invocation, speech, report. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something about that I, I there's something, there's a lot of things about it that I, I admire, mm. I, you know, and, and so I, I do see the Guy, Guyanese writers 
painters, musicians, the arts generally and all, all together as instructive because it's informed by the light, the land, those currents and rhythms, and that they should inform the politics mm. as much as possible and enrich it. I know it's difficult saying that, but you know, that's how it is for me. I always talk about Guyana in terms of love, never about disappointment because my childhood leaving there, I left there with that same childhood nugget of nuggets, it's plural, everything is plural, there's no singular, of wisdom and so on. So I'm not gonna look back at it and say and, and talk about it in disappointing ways at all. I'm just going to say, look, you know, here's the positivity of the place for me. Here's my ancestral mix up. This is what I think it said when it said land of you know many rivers and six peoples. This or seven, yeah. <laughs> this is what they are when they're thrown together. I know it's complicated, but let's use it as instructive when we look at power and resources and policy. And then the, keep that complexity in the conversation. Mm. Um, and I think the gesture of reaching across the aisle, whatever that might be, I want that gesture to, to be a rich one to think of kids. So there are all kinds of things written. Into, I know it's, it's a long answer to mm. your question, but I just wanted to point to the, when I, I mean, I wrote the book, Mama Dot was my first book. Airy Hall was my second book. You know, I, I kept going back, going on about, about the, as a young writer, about yeah. the resource of the place. Yeah. And I, I stick with that. I think looking back at it, I think, yeah, I paid homage to it. If people miss that and they're thinking, oh, you're going far and you're going here. Well, fine, think that, but please go back to the work. Look at the work. If you can find it, you can with the web and see that. Um, you know, if it, there's something about the place that you don't, you never leave, that's um, formative. It's, it's, it's interesting hearing you talk about how, because I've always felt, gosh, Guyana would be so wonderful if, wonderful if the artists and the writers were the politicians. <laughs> 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 Everything would be solved. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I, I just love the, um, it, it is a celebration, like I find in the right, Guyanese writing is a celebration of the cook up, <laughs> you know, of everything about Guyana. And it, it's so, uh, you know, it's so enriching, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Fred, I'm wondering, can you can you share something from your book with the, with the audience? Have you got a reading that we could um, hear? Yeah, you know, I, 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 I thought it, a brief taste. You've got some, okay. Let me, um, I, I've got it on, in front of me here. Um, this is deep into the book, addressing cancer. Um, cancer needs a song, tambourine and cymbals and a choir, not to raise it from the dead, but lay it to rest, finally. This will have to be arranged by a songster. All I have to do is write the lyrics, a songbook, for surely Cancer and I are in a production that is the scale of an opera. You rocked me to sleep when you slept. Now I choose to stay awake. I shake with your laughter through years. I want to stop time in you and take your life that is my life as well. Here is to all the times that you moved without thinking about me. Here is to all your lovers and children, I stake my claim of your life. For my life is not worth living if you live on. My goal is to see us both dead. I live for this death of ours. Do not make me live a moment longer. For all your laughter, I feel pain. All your life is my despair. I am cancer and no good comes from me. That's cancer, speak, cancer speaking in a long, un uninterrupted fashion. Here's the reply. And for counterpoint, I do not want you for a guest. There is hardly enough room in me for all the things I have become and all the things left for me to be. I wish I could take you for a walk around the neighborhood. Instead, you hide in me and chew your way out. My body jumps and skips and twists to songs of health and wealth. Just as lights stirs the world to rise and shine, so I wake and dance the tap of that light on my heels, forehead, shoulders, back and belly, the sugar and spice in me, for life does not include you, Mr. C. 
reprised by, as I'm soon done, hang on, <laughs> wait right there. I have to fetch my weapons. You bring rhythm, I bring your downfall. Let's swing until one of us is left standing or both of us fall. This is how it goes between my cancer and me. By turns, rhythm and blues, soul and funk, jazz and calypso. Wonderful. You know, you know, um, you're reminding me in that passage how much music runs through your your book and how melodic it is, you know, to read. I think that's what made it so easy to read it actually quite fast. It's very melodic and rhythmic. The whole, the whole um, you know, your writing is, it's just wonderful. Um, and it's so strange because it's so, I mean, a lot of it's horrific. It, it, it's really horrible. <laughs> you know, everything you go through is really horrible. And yet um, I love that somewhere there's still that kind of, um, you know, the book reminded me actually of Alice Walker's um, statement. She says, um, resistance is the secret of joy. And there was something about that, that I, I could feel the whole way through your kind of resistance and your, the kind of, and the humor, you know, I loved, I loved all of it. Um, I just thought it was amazing. But the one area that did make me feel, and I think because, um, I think because everybody here across the pond, you know, we were really, um, also moved by George Floyd's death, death and everything that was going on in the state. So of course we had the marches here. Mm -hmm. And I think the one thing that I, I, I felt a kind of connection to and also a tiredness about was mm -hmm. this thing mm -hmm. of the black body, you know, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and you can't escape your black body. Um, I wondered if you could kind of talk a, a bit more about that. And, and do you have a kind of vision of what a post George Floyd Black Lives Matter future looks like? Yeah, you know, I, well, you mentioned the resistance thing that, from Alice Walker. I'm thinking of Martin Carter's okay. poems of resistance, you know, yeah. I'm thinking of the way in which his voice spoke on behalf of what he felt was a group of people who didn't have the microphone. He had the microphone, and so he was, there was a responsibility as a poet to speak on their behalf mm. and represent um, what he thought they represented. Um, so, poem. The resistance there is an interesting thing for an artist, the position of the arts and its, its responsibilities. Um, you know, I don't have a prescription for um, Black Lives Matter is, is such a carefully thought out and nuanced campaign in the US in particular. And it's fighting a, a very big, big fight um, that's ongoing to do with um, accountability mm. in the police um when they face black bodies and then to do the thing that james brown was singing about say it loud i'm black and i'm proud mm. but if you have to if, if you have to sing that it means you're singing back to a force that erased your personhood and you have to once again put that humanity back into your chant to remind them hey i'm a person mm. and it's a sad admission that his his, his line from the seventh is early 771, I think, that we need to have a, a movement now to remind a force in society that still mm. refuses to grant black people mm. their right, their full civil rights, and is still trying to erode those rights. And that's an American landscape. It's true for the UK. And when it comes to power, it's true for uh, people, working class, people in a nation who have to organize and resist mm. to get power to, to pay attention. It's also a desire to see power enlivened and be generous, not a pyramid structure dictating to a majority, but a real conversation, which I'd love to see break out. Um, so yeah, I, I am so good. I don't want to be prescriptive, you know, I, I do feel that I'm yeah, more generous, a big, a more generous approach to people who don't have as much. A sense that um, if you have a lot, you got to share. You got to do what. Um, now, and there's a track by Bob Marley. I'm not going to sing it, you know, but I, he did. He does say, um, "In no woman will cry." He's got a line where he's, you know, uh, uh, when they're sitting in the project, which is longer exists, but he says, "We have cornmeal porridge of which I'll share with you." 
Mm. Now, cornmeal porridge, if you've got that and you're willing to share it, there's mm. something about that generosity mm. which I'll share with you. It's both the song that he's going to share with the listener, but it's the willingness to say, this is where it came from, this idea that no matter how little you have, there's enough. Come, pull up a seat. Or, you know, I'm, I'm going to move over, sit down. Let's, let's go into this pot together. There's enough. And I think that generosity that comes from that very situation he describes of poverty, there's something about it that keeps conscience alive, even when you're struggling. Mm -hmm. That the resistance that it informs you, your body and your conscience and your thinking, that resistance, um, it's a university of hunger. So going back to Martin Carter, mm. but I don't want to be too, you know, I teach, so I have to be very careful about theory. No, we're loving uh, it. All the comments, no, you know, you've got to be careful. Because Free lectures sense, are good. <laughs> you know what you really want? You don't want to tell people what to do and how to think. You want them to discover it because it's already planted in their bodies. It's yeah. already enfolded in their, in their being. And you want them to wake up to it. You don't want to say, let's yeah. do this and push them in and cajole them. It's a process that's organic, embryonic, and uh, you, you know, you, you, and also because I didn't learn by being bullied. I learned, I, 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 was, I was taught by example, mm. by watching, listening, re repetition, surely. Um, if someone bullied something into me and I did something, is when they're watching me directly to bully me to do it, then I did it. As soon as they turned their back, I thought, man, I'm not doing that. It's nonsense. <laughs> I didn't understand it. I had to understand it as a process. And I think for that to be the case, the teaching has to, can't be um, bullying. Mm -hmm. It has to draw the person out. It has to involve them and be interactive in ways. Mm -hmm. So it, it the, the pedagogy is different yeah. from... So, so writing to is, uh, and true repetition and discovery, I, I've realized too that um, so many versions of my poems didn't work. That it's it's interesting too that um, if I really listened to the, my art and leaned into my art, how it's worked for me, a lot of it is about failure. A lot of it is about um, returning to a site that appears to yield nothing and insisting that it gives you something again. And then there's a song element to it that however little I have in my pot you know, there's enough for you the plate will be if, it, if, it's a t if it's a tin plate you'll hear a lot of noise because there isn't much to give to go around but the idea is that if you say you are willing to share and you sing about it mm. then that song when it plunges into the body mm. it yields much more than you can predict mm. and that's what I like about that kind of instruction in art you can never say one plus one equals two in art. The idea is that what it yields will be unpredictable because you don't know exactly what led you into that process of writing. It's not always that's happening, I'm gonna write directly about it. It's, I don't know, let me find out by writing what I don't know as an act of discovery. There is that too, it sounds a little bit bourgeois <laughs> to talk about it as I don't know, therefore I'm going to write. Mm. Um, because when I, the poems I've written where I say, I know, let me write, they were poems that, you know, they, they didn't do this thing that I enjoy in the best poems, which is you discover something as you go along that you didn't know. Mm. And something is woke, woken up in you, something awake, something arises um, in you. Martin Carter talks about it uh, in, in poems um, of resistance and poems of succession about that process of awakening through reading and through thinking and through song. Mm -hmm. And then I think finally too, not finally, it's never final, but one of the things I like about the art is it's singing. It's um, the Maya Angelou thing, I know why the caged bird sings. Mm -hmm. And the thing that Toni Morrison said about art being beautiful, political art. Um, those things are talking about it as an aesthetic, as mm -hmm. a, a kind of apprenticeship. Um, not just craft, but art as well. Something a bit magic as well, something a little bit Baku and Jambi about it, which you must insist on, you know, just allow it to be in there. Don't even account for it. Just say, okay, yes, it's a little bit mysterious. There's a percentage that has to be. And so, yeah, some play, um, it's serious, but some play. And something about misery not being allowed to win the day. Mm. And, you know, it's gonna, Hunger must, will guide you and hunger will be your compass. But let it be your university as well. Let it be that, um, you know, you, you fold it into your art so that someone isn't hurt and destroyed 
because of the rage you're feeling. That the rage has a place to go, a temple, a house, a safe place, a place of experimentation, is what I'm also thinking about. I'm pausing here because I, I, I'm so aware of being prescriptive and not wanting to be too much because I, I, I do like classrooms where mm. things are discovered. I do want to walk into classrooms and say, you know, here's this poem. I've cut it into several sentences. I've jumbled them up, come up with an arrangement that suits you. Give me an account for why, because you want them to discover how the, the poem's procedure. Um, and because that learning is, the, the students don't forget that. It becomes a part of their process. And I, I think, you know, that's fantastic. It's not, you know, empty vessels you're pouring stuff into, so much as vessels already containing something that you're bringing out and drawing out. And, and, and so on so yeah so um gosh i had so many things going through my head while you were talking i i, I did keep expecting a baku to appear in your book <laughs> it was so funny i was like this, there must be a pesky baku in here somewhere but, um... baku, i saw good good yes um yeah I, yeah, we used to make bakus. I never saw baku. I never saw, we used to use a little small marble, little um, ball bearing. Yeah. And um, we used to take the foil paper and you just make a little shape and then it used to move. <laughs> so that, there it goes. It's alive. Um, so we always tried through physics to get to metaphysics in, in, in our little lives. And uh, sorry, I saw a note from Gus, Gus John that popped up about um, the curricula. Yeah, well, let's go. Let's go to the Q and A's actually. Yeah, yes, thank, um, you. thank you. Because uh, yeah, um, so yeah, let me read Gus's. So Gus says, "Hi, Fred. We were four square. Oh, you were four square with us many decades ago as we sought to decolonize curriculum and institutions through the work we did in the International Book Fair of Radical Black and Third World Books. How long do you believe that this new post?" George Floyd and Black Lives Matter consciousness would last and what dent will it make in business as usual? Um, be before you go on to that, um, Fred, I think it's important for people to realize you were in Los Angeles. So you must have been right at the heart of all the um, protests as well uh, uh, that mm -hmm. were going on at the time. Yeah, I, I, it's, I wrote about, a lot about it in the book. Thank you, Jack, Gus, for that complex thought. It is so such a complex start, it, it partly answers itself by its um, clarity. Mm. Um, in, in the sense that the curriculum is a key, it continues to be updated and revised. The struggle is unending, it's what uh, Wilson Harris talks about, infinite rehearsal. It doesn't finish off. But there is a moment when you enter it, for me, being in LA last year, when everything was locked down and so much was um, exploding on the streets, lots of demonstrations all over the place. I, um, it made me think about the students who were being arrested, actually, other students were arrested for going and went out on behalf of George Floyd, on behalf of black people they felt who were under attack. These are a lot of white students. They decided enough is enough, we're next. We, you know, we, we have to count ourselves with them because they, this is not right. So I did feel that, that, that that's instructive and should be brought into the classroom. So that, here's how it endures, I think, in answer to your question. Um, business as usual will always pretend, you know, power will always say, I can ignore you for a long time. I have the force, I have the police force, I have the army, I have all these things I can use if I need to, and I don't need to pay attention to you. That's the power at its most stubborn. Mm -hmm. Then there's a side of it that wants authentication from the people and from the, the so-called masses, the, the, the majority. And that's where you address your speech too. You get involved and keep those questions alive and keep the conversation going at every committee you can join and every person that comes to you with power you receive them. What about, what are you doing about? And you hold them to book. So business as usual will try and forget and move on and pull the sting out of protest. Um, so I do think, um, yeah, I do, I do feel that um, if you look at it, you can say, oh yeah, it's, it's all gonna settle down at some point. It's gonna simmer down, but it's not. It's mm -hmm. kept on the boil because the, the, the killings continue, by the way, the despotic behavior continues. So there are reminders that you have to keep vigilant so I'm not going to be romantic about it and say, oh yes, X, Y, and Z, and Z have happened. 
they haven't happened, the conversation continues. But just think of the statues going down and how long the statues have been up as an example of change. And you'll see the conversation is happening and there are material results. The struggle continues, you know, we're, we're, and it will continue. I'm at a level where I'm not on the, on the barricades. I'm not leading a charge. I'm in the arts. It's a slower process, more deliberative. It's one person at a time, one soul at a time. It's involved with the young as I teach and want them to go out and be readers and thinkers in complex ways that defy power and, and despotism. So I do think, um, Gus, I hope this is answering your question, Gus. It, it, it is a long, a long engagement. It's a lifelong engagement, as you know. Things change, just, you know, one step forward, two step backward in a Babylon. You know the song, you know the song. I can't <laughs> sing it, but there is that song that reminds us it's a struggle mm -hmm. not to get complacent, basically. The song isn't saying, it's, you know, you're finished, you can't win. The song is saying, do not be complacent. Mm -hmm. Keep going, be vigilant. And then use the chant. If the song is depressing, use the chant of the very song, its own tune, to power you on. Mm -hmm. I always feel that about music that's singing elegiacally about sadness and defeat and burial, that if you repeat it, there is something that, uh, um, if you understand it, you overstand it. Sorry, let me, let me go, let me go temporarily rest on you here. If you over, overstand it, it means you've really taken the tune and use it as a wave to ride you out of despair, not to bury you in it, but to lift you through repetition, song, rhythm, movement, mm. breathing. So I do think there's, a, there's something about that in art that, that falls into its process of staring at hard at hurt, that the process of staring hard at hurt does turn that hurt. It's not me saying this, this is from reading everybody into something transformative. And that that's the thing that you want to go to in the art. Mm -hmm. The pain isn't about defeat. It's about saying, look, mm -hmm. let us get the instruction from it. So I do want people to, to kind of, yes, hold hands, reach across the divide, insist on the com complex narrative, mm -hmm. refuse oversimplification, pull the sting out of power, mm -hmm. cuddle, if it's a wasp, I don't advise this for the marabunta because they're big <laughs> and bad, but <laughs> cuddle the wasp of the struggle and be stung by it gently. Not a marabunta, of course, although I, I, my stepdad has, is, he would walk up to marabuntas, you know, he, I, and we I just take, put them between his index finger and thumb and squash them <laughs> if they got too close. Um, I thought, wow, I wouldn't try that. I, don't I, try this. I, I, I have to say, Fred, my husband, we, we lived on the uh, Pomeroon and okay. under the spelling, there was always loads and loads of marabuntas living under there. Yes, live and he, got, live. he got stung oh, no, in the head. Two, um, <laughs> twice on his head <laughs> and it knocked him out. For, I mean, like flat on his back completely. Yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, so, yeah. You're reminding me of that. There's a, that, that passage that you say, though my body is overrun with disease, my spiritual cup runneth over with the help of music, politics, yeah. culture, education, and arts. And it, there is something really, do you know, I was so surprised because I saw actually a review of your work, um, of your book today, and it was sort of saying there's no hope in your book. And I really disagree with them. I have to say, I loved you know, there was always music, there's always music, there's always art, and it's, and that's what helps you keep resisting. Um, I want to go to another audience question, if I can, um, Fred. Um, <laughs> Gus John by the says, thank you, very helpful and very wise. Um, but going to Adele Sewell, Adele um, is, uh, she's a member of Guyana Speaks, of course, but she's also um, had cancer in, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and she's got to be one of the most inspiring women as far as I'm concerned, because she won't let this, she's never going to be defeated by it. Um, I, I, Adele, I don't know if you want to um, unmute and ask your question directly. Are you hi, there? Yeah. Hi, yes, yeah. Hello. Hello. Um, hi. I wondered if you could share with us what you found is the hardest struggle of um, 
going through cancer in the pandemic. And also, I know that you don't like to give advice, but I wonder what suggestions you would have for anyone going through cancer now. Thank you, Adele. And <clears throat> I assume you, you got through it, okay? Did you get through your thing? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. Great, lovely. You no, it it lick. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you lick it, yes. <laughs> you should be doing this, you know. <laughs> yes, it yeah, licks like peas. Um, yes, there is. Um, uh, well, good, yeah. Um, well, for, first, you know, I, it is depressing to be sick in a way that brings to the, the front of your nose, hits you on the nose about your, your mortality. For it to be circumscribed and shortened in this formal way by disease beats an already interesting conundrum we have as humans that we have after a certain amount of time to give up on everything that we have and pass on from our material bodies. We, all, we have that in our, built into our lives already, into our bi biology. But when you have a disease, the disease cell says, well, oh, yes, you may have this time if you haven't have got an accident, but now I'm gonna give you a shorter receipt, <laughs> threaten you with this thing. And that's the thing that I, I was concerned about was this, how do I answer that? And then with the treatment, I must to keep me from getting this depressed because it is depressing when you face something as big as that. And then you have to go to the medical model and surrender to it so it can help you. Um, there is a psychological condition that you have to wrestle with after all the physical treatments are done that continues. And that's to do with that um, sense of being awoken. I'm trying to say woke too, <laughs> but the, the verb isn't quite working um, to, to this fact that you were tapped on the shoulder by this long finger, that's very grim, saying to you, maybe I'll cut your thing, your honeymoon short with this life. It made me fiercely delight in the very basics of being alive in a way that I didn't take it for granted anymore. I started to notice deliberately note. I always noticed, as a poet, you always notice things you have to, you get trained to do it. But I decided to linger and go slow with my routine deliberately because I knew I was feeling this sense of um, despair and depression about, about cancer in me. And so I used everything. This is why I went back to Airy Hall guy in Georgetown, you know, mm -hmm. talked, talked and talked about it with my mom, my dad, um, my grandmother. You know, I, I insisted on pulling all that in. So yeah, it, it's a long answer. Adele, but I'm just trying to tell you that um, it was psychologically a hit in the solar plexus. It winded me. I didn't go down on the canvas. I, well, I did, but I got back up. And then I looked at what was making me stand back up and face it and move on. And what is that quality about life that I'm fighting for? And all the routine became shinier for me. All the aromas became more precious, you know. What number mango is this I'm sniffing? It smells good. What is that jamun fruit? Give me some more guava when it's ripe. Remember when, it, when guava is ripe, remember that smell again. I deliberately did conjured all those things and thought, yes, don't eat, it, eat the guava when it's green because it's gonna bind your belly. Remember that as a kid. But when you cut the green guava, look how neat, look at the pattern of those seeds in there. Look at, and that's so far. So I deliberately summon all of that because I, I'll be damned if I'm going to have the color drained from my life mm. by the disease, which was trying to do that. It was trying to, you know, flatten experience and then circum, you know, circumscribe it, circumvent it, end it early. And I was trying to find ways to stretch it out, elasticate the moment, insist on saying, you know, if cancer, if it's you against me, this is what I have. Here's some metaphor, deal with that. And I had a slingshot and it was a badly made one, but you know, I, I fired off some shots with some you know, mud balls dried in the sun, loaded into that slingshot and sent up against the giant cancer. And so there were a number of, in other words, I'm saying there were a number of strategies, song and so on. For example, I listened to a lot of jazz, the usual song playlist, which I have, a, a playlist for cancer. My playlist had on it, um, Coltrane's A Love, A Love Supreme. The album, if you know the album, people out there, 
listen to it if you don't know it, but it's a lovely composition about spontaneity and the, the form of free jazz, how it works right. and what it comes back to. And, what, and because he was breathing into his instrument to create those sounds, I felt it was, it was something about the, the, the way in which this, the album goes about an instruction to me about my breathing and where I'm going with my cancer, always keeping the art at the center of my daily routine, always insisting on the color in the ordinary, um, thinking, yeah, if, my, if I'm seeing things a lot in terms of being ins instructed by my sight, how do I bring the other senses to bear? It's touch, smell, taste, because those things were maybe had a, were going to come to an end if nothing worked for me in the treatments. So there was that um, <clears throat> ordinary, sorry to go on, but <clears throat> Adele, it's a long answer telling you that everything <laughs> came to my rescue and helped me. I, I think the same, the same, Adele would tell you it was, possibly would tell you it was the same for her because Adele's now become an artist. <laughs> I'm just, she's been through so many different, uh, well, apart from the fact that she tra she's traveled the world now and, um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's really, I, I felt like if I had a friend who had cancer, I would give them your book because it was so, it's so hard, you know, I could feel the difficulty in it, but also just the tools that you were offering. And I actually thought that that was probably why you were being so transparent, because I was just like, this is what everybody needs to read, you know, before they get cancer. <laughs> Thank you for saying that last bit, because I was going to say, Juanita, don't tell them they have to wait to get cancer to read the book. No, them, <laughs> no, before, it, it, literally exactly, before, exactly. you know, before, yeah. because it gives you all the, yeah. I, I felt like I had, you know, we'd been through the same 2020, but yours had been like, you know, <laughs> like a hundred times worse, but it was, it was just, um, I felt like I now have the tools, you know, if I, if I have to face something really difficult, I have the tools. It's, it's that kind of, um, a book for me anyway I don't know how other people experience it but Adele's been like that for me as well because when Adele um has, has dealt with cancer the whole way through she's had this same kind of well there's always been hope you know even though you have the moments of despair you always you still have that kind of hope and I and I just love you know I I love that uh, you know, because my, my own mother went through cancer, but she kind of had a different approach. And I just think it's so important for people to understand the despair, but always to to hold on to that, that amazing hope. Um, Sandra has put a comment in here, um, Sandra Agard. So she said her beloved sister, Brenda, lost her battle with the big C in um, 2012. I don't know if you know Brenda Agard. She was actually um, a very gifted uh, photographer, poet, playwright mm -hmm. and teacher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, Sandra says one of the last creative acts she did was help me to compose the Olympic poem written by Southwark school children. The image of her sitting at the computer, surrounded by all the children's images and words will remain with me always. That was her slingshot and ultimately mine. Thank you so Beautiful. much, Fred. You have given so much clarity to this awful usurper in our midst. Um, yeah. And yeah, so there's, you know, there's lots of lovely other comments. I don't think there's any other questions. I don't know if I've missed any, um, but I, I, I'm kind of getting from you a sense of what, well, and actually also through the book, the sense of almost, I can feel you changing as a person in a sense through the book. And I wondered if you can talk to, you know, how those experiences of 2020 have changed you. Obviously, you've talked about the smell of the, you know, the guava, you know, those things are clearly much more heightened. But are you living your life differently as well now? You know, not a little. Yeah, you know, I'm not drinking <laughs> um, as much. <laughs> I never did smoke. Um, I, I inhaled. But, you know, um, I, I, I am thinking more of the body uh, as a temple. You, you know, what you put in there, um, you know, not red meat, no. More you're, not, you're not going back to the Guyana, um, you know, the homeopathic remedies of cod liver oh, yeah. oil. Or... <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. We, the man that was wicked when you were a kid, a whole, one spoon of that and you're gone for the day. <laughs> no, I don't recommend it. But yeah. um, 
yes, something homeopathic in the wisdom, something about um, yeah, songs, um, movement, uh, lighten up a little bit. Um, Can you say something about the liberty? You you spoke in the book about liberty. I like <laughs> the Rastafarian. No, no, I Walter like Rod that. <laughs> well, Walter Rodney has a book called um, Groundings with My Brothers, a little book he wrote in Jamaica mm. um, when he was there for a short period before he was expelled. And um, the Rastafarian idea of liberty, uh, it's it's basically that, um, in, and you, you can add to this and take away from it, that each moment is has a certain amount of plural things in it that's good for you, that you should be tuned into and wake up to. And one of them is community, of course. One is a, a sense of yourself as joined the I and I idea, the we-ness of you, the, the two-ness and three-ness of your body. Um, so liberty is a whole approach to life that's healthy and seeing the body as in a kind of holy way. I don't want to get too religious about it and put people off, but it's if, because I mentioned temple already, so I see myself leaning heavily on, um, on, 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 the, on the language of religion to make the point, but there is something spiritual about the everyday. And I take it, I take it that um, the knowledge you have from that and the grounding, as Walter Rodney would put it, with, with the brothers and sisters mm -hmm. and people, is that you bring into that talk and understanding and overstanding of the, of of the, the the daily ordinary routine of life, and then and with that, if power pays attention, power becomes benevolent. You can't this it doesn't disappear because you do need to aim it at certain projects to get things done but you can make it fair you can make it communal so it's about that i think liberty i mean there's so many reg tracks i can think of that will do that you know dennis brown sings so much about that and other people burning spare and other people what so was what was the one piece of music you couldn't have done without then oh well i think yeah the, I, I mentioned dennis brown because he sings um psalm 23 beautifully uh, yeah, you, you yeah. love psalm 23 yeah yeah, yeah, yeah he sings that beautifully uh -huh. um i mentioned um, a number of people um some calypsos i i think as well the, the paul robeson um you mentioned a, the you wrote about the words that paul robeson uses and yeah. somewhere in the beginning i thought that yeah that was really interesting uh, yeah but... well he has, to, he has so many but old man river and, and other things very he yeah. Sings the history. What I like about Robson is he had he was such a gifted figure, and but he was punished by a backward society at the time mm. for speaking out. And I think what I liked about I like about his example is that his conscience was so sharp that he couldn't sell his art down the road. It had to be oriented mm. towards the least able in society and speak on behalf of a history that was painful. So his historical imagination for me, an example is really enduring. Um, you know, during a very difficult time, McCarthyism punished him, no end, took away his passport and everything else, but you know, he, he had that. So his art and the way he sang reminded us that maybe art can have a moral imperative and an ethical process to it that we can learn from and benefit from um, by, by knowing about. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Fred. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm conscious that I've already stolen 18 more minutes of your time than <laughs> I was supposed to. Um, so I, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And um, I, I just have to keep plugging the book. Guys, you have to buy it, literally. Like any guy in he's in the house who doesn't buy it, you, 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 you're not. There's there's a section also on Br'er Rabbit, which of course, um, I mean, there's just so much. It's such a pleasure to read, particularly if you're Guyanese, I think. <laughs> it, yeah. it gives you an extra, extra um, dimension. Um, I okay. wanted, while I remember here, um, to just, um, now oh draw your attention into the chat um renaissance one has just um put in there year of plagues a memoir okay so you've basically got the calendar of um fred's uk tours 
um, the tour dates which run from the 23rd to the 5th of November. So Thank you. just have a look at that and the link in um, the Renaissance One link. Um, and just, uh, I think that's pretty much it. There aren't any other questions and I think we're good, we're good there. Uh, um, my, my motto is uh, resistance is a secret of joy. So I'm going with that and I, and, and I think that, I feel that in your book and, that, and I love that. Um, Fred, do you want to, let me give you the last word, please, the final <laughs> word. What, what well, would you, you like listeners. to say to us? Thank you for tuning in because you know, these things are difficult as you know, but I appreciate the community. The, you know, writers need readers, you know, we, so we, and we need conversation to, to feed us as we try to feed back mm -hmm. and we break bread, and share that cornmeal porridge. And share the cornmeal porridge, indeed, yeah. indeed. Um, so before we go, I just want to remind everybody as well, our usual Guyana Speaks guys, it, um, we've got another Guyana Speaks next Sunday and um, it rounds off Black History Month for us, which although I don't agree with <laughs> the idea of Black History Month per se, because it should be all year round, right? So we're gonna keep going year round. But um, essentially we've got uh, Arthur Torrington and um, Professor John Rickford mm -hmm. and Claudia Tomlinson. And it should be a really um, brilliant session. We'll also be, I think Claudia Tomlinson is going to be talking about Jessica Huntley. Um, John Rickford will be talking about Creole Patois Ebonics. So that should be really, really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And Arthur's going to be talking about some Guyanese figures through history that we, that have only recently been discovered. So um, yeah, it should be a really good event. And it's, don't forget the clocks go back. Is that right? Next, <laughs> next Sunday, they fall back. I should say they fall back, fall back. So, um, yeah. Yeah, next Sunday. But um, I just want to bring it to a close. If, if everybody just wants to put your hands together in appreciation. Thank you so, thank you, so much. Thank you, Gus, Fred. John, David, Abedin, Sandra Agard, Adele, Monita, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Harold Lussman was there. Wow. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank can, you. I say, can I say how much I've enjoyed both seeing you and listening to you and your reading was most poetic, <laughs> not the poetic, poetic prose. There are so many things that you, you spoke about it to take me a, a little book to respond to them. But one thing that I would like to say is that this question of, of, of metaphysics, there's no doubt that is a very, very uh, potent thing within the Guyanese personality. And it comes yes, out then. very much within their writing and their art and, and the rest of it. And the Thank other you. thing was uh, uh, very, very important, which is, which is totally overlooked, is that the, the politics, the, the, the possibility of politics being informed by the creative arts mm -hmm. doesn't exist. And it's, it's a very important principle if we're going to think of the development, development mm -hmm. as a nation. But I don't see, unfortunately, I don't see any signs of it right now. But the thank basis you. of it, of course, lies within education. Yes, sir. Well anyway, said. Thank you, Fred. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Stan, you. I, you made it today. <laughs> Thank you, Stan. I, 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 I agree. Yesterday, yesterday, I was on this thing about an hour trying to get through on the, on the machine. I call it, I call it a, a white people obia. But, uh, my daughter, my daughter Fiona, gave me um, an African word for it, because apparently there are two words in Africa that 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 um, in, in, are engaged in this concept. And the one I liked best was the one from East Africa, which is witchy gunzu. Mm -hmm. And witchy gunzu means the kind of things that happens when you interfere with the, the things that white people, the things that the people who like to stray about make. That is it. When you get involved with the things that people who like to stray about make, look out for trouble, witchy gunzu. Mm -hmm. So I was fully engaged with it yesterday. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> 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 I'm going to appear <laughs> now in one of Fred's <laughs> poems. Watch, watch. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna press end. I know it's always yeah. difficult to end the Zoom. Thank thing, you, everybody. Thank you. What good is this? You have to say not end. You have to say you're gonna press the end. <laughs> the end, <Yes>. indeed. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. The right. end. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Stan. Bye, David.